So structural soundness EBVs have been published within the Trans-Tasman Angus Cattle Evaluation since December 2016. And during that time, there's been some review of those and that ultimately resulted in some um, general improvements and changes being made to the structural soundness EBVs in December 2020. And in this video, we'll just have a quick recap of those changes which were made. So those changes can um, loosely be divided into five key areas being the publication of EBVs for more animals, the increased ability for uh, Angus breeders to submit structural scores for inclusion in the analysis, the incorporation of genomic information into the calculation of the EBV, the ability to directly compare the breeding values with North American um, EPDs or estimated progeny differences, and also some changes to the analytical model. And we'll go through each of those changes now in a little bit more detail. So the first major change which was made was the publication of the structural EBVs for more animals. So on this table you can see um, it describes the number of animals which had structural EBVs in the old genetic evaluation and then also the number of animals which has EBVs in the new genetic evaluation. So for example you can see animals born in 2020, um, the number of animals with structural EBVs published has increased from 6,000 to around 37,000, so you know, quite a, a six-fold increase in the number of animals with breeding values, which is providing greater tools um, and, and, a, and a better description I suppose of Angus animals um, for these important structural traits which will facilitate um, more selection accuracy and therefore more genetic improvement for these traits within the Angus breed. The second major change which was um, implemented in December 2020 was a number of different strategies to increase the ability um, to, of Angus breeders to submit structural scores for um, inclusion in the analysis and in particular the removal of, of several barriers which have been identified which were preventing um, a widespread uptake of structural scoring and, and inclusion of that information in the calculation of the EBVs. So the first was a move but previously um, all the structural scores had to be collected by an accredited technician. In December 2020, the move was made to also accept um, breeder collected scores alongside any scores which come from an accredited technician. And there was some uh, significant research done before that decision was made. So in particular, um, it was reviewed the scores which have been collected by breeders um, were, and the usefulness, I suppose, of those for uh, describing genetic differences in structure and, and use, effectiveness for genetic evaluation was compared to uh, the scores which were collected by accredited technician. And as by the heritability estimates which we display here, there was very similar um, heritabilities in, in the scores collected by the two different groups. So for claw set, uh, it was 0.22 if it was collected by uh, breeders and 0.25 um, if it was collected by an accredited technician. And likewise for foot angle, it was 0.23 by, uh, collected by breeders and 0.24 if it was collected by accredited technicians. So both sets of data was um, deemed to be of, of similar effectiveness for, for genetic evaluation and so now the scores from breeder collected, um, so people's collecting scores on their own animals um, is now accepted into the evaluation. And that's particularly being targeted at trying to increase the number of scores uh, which we have on females. So previously uh, we tended to get lots of scores just on animals on their the bull sales, um, so sale, sorry, bulls in their upcoming sale uh, when the accredited technician would come around. But now really trying to encourage people to um, collect scores on their females, so on their, their yearling heifers, and then also on their mature cows. It is recommended, however, if, if people are unsure about collecting the scores themselves um, or they were looking at animals, particularly they're in upcoming sales, that they still continue to use an accredited technician by way of having the independent scorer um, collect the scores on those animals. And all of the, both the accredited scores and the breeder collected scores are both uh, collected in, um, accepted for inclusion in the analysis. Likewise, we do still collect um, the, the scorer, so we understand um, whether that score has been taken by a, a, the breeder of the animal or an accredited technician, so that the usefulness of those scores can be monitored on an ongoing basis, and, in, and if needed, the analysis can be adjusted accordingly in the future. 
Uh, the next change which was made was to accept uh, scores into the analysis from um, mature breeding females. So previously only scores were um, included in the analysis if they were taken on animals at less than 750 days of age. And that was identified as, as somewhat of a limitation given um, animals often don't express their, their full differences in these structural traits until an older age. Um, and so it's been why that age bracket has been um, I suppose expanded to enable um, those scores on the mature breeding females to be submitted. There's also now previous, in the previous analysis, only one uh, score on each particular animal could be included in the analysis. A repeatability model has been um, adopted within the analysis, which now enables animals to be scored multiple times. So the, the, I guess the recommended practice now is that uh, people will collect structural scores on their animals once as, as kind of yearlings or, or young animals, and then once on their mature breeding females each year. And those scores on their mature breeding females can be collected at any time throughout the production cycle. So those three strategies which were implemented, uh, we've now seen that there has been a, they have achieved what they were um, designed to do. So particularly in the 2021, we saw a 38% increase in the number of structural scores uh, which were submitted into uh, for inclusion in the trans Tasman Angus cattle evaluation. So the number of animals uh, with scores increased from just around 7,900 up until um, just over 10,000, and we'd hope to see that continue to increase into the future, and with more scores coming in, increasing the accuracy of those breeding values and providing a, a more useful selection tool for the industry. The third major change and, and probably the most significant change which was implemented in December 2020 was to move to incorporate um, genomic information in the calculation of the breeding values. So previously, uh, the calculation of the structural EBVs only included um, pedigree information and also the, the score information which has been collected on animals. Now there are three different sources of information which contribute to those EBVs. So we have the pedigree information, the genomic, uh, sorry, the, the scores as, as they were before, and now also any genomic or DNA information which might be available on animals. And the research at the time has, has indicated that the predictive accuracy of those um, animals of the EBVs, pardon, um, a, a way in which I suppose the breeding values are predicting the, the breeding value of those animals and, and how they correlate to progeny scores increases from around uh, a correlation of 0.41 to 0.65. So we have uh, quite a significant increase in the predictive accuracy of those breeding values with the incorporation of genomic information. The fourth change is, is um, that the genetic evaluation is now conducted in association with the uh, American and Canadian Angus associations. So as a result, we now have breeding values in, uh, of animals in the three different countries that are now directly comparable for foot angle and uh, claw set. And that's particularly a, a benefit um, when we're looking at bringing in uh, genetics from the overseas gene pools and particularly when we're evaluating the use of potential AI size and that again was identified as a limitation in, in the, the previous analysis but now we have a way where we can assess that on, on a level playing field. Now while those breeding values are uh, directly comparable across the three countries, they are still published um, in a slightly customised way for, um, to be consistent with how the other breeding values in each country are published. So particularly we publish our breeding values in the trans Tasman Angus cattle evaluation as EBVs or estimated breeding values, whereas in North America they're still published as um, estimated progeny differences or, or EPDs. We also have a different accuracy scale on which we um, publish those breeding values. So in the, the trans Tasman Angus cattle evaluation the, the accuracy value uh, reflects the correlation between the, the estimated breeding value and the true breeding value, whereas in North America the accuracy values are um, published on the, the BIF um, kind of scale. And we also have now specific reference tables for the different countries. So the, the percentile bands and, and breed averages which we publish in Australia reflect animals, the, the kind of the, the genetic pool in Australia and New Zealand if you like. So. Um, and now we need a benchmark within that population, whereas in North America, they're relevant to the North American animals. So as an example of that, if we, we look at the, um, the breeding values and how they're published in each of the different analyses for, uh, say, bull like Baldridge Beast Mode, uh, commonly used bull in Australia, um, and New Zealand. So in Australia and New Zealand, we have a, an EBV there of plus 0.58. In North America, the EPD is plus 0.9. So exactly half of the, the EBV. 
And so likewise, if, we, if we're looking at um, potential AI size, we only have EPDs available. We just need to multiply that EPD by two to get the EBV as it would report in Australia. Likewise, if we're trying to convert the EBV to the EPD, we can just divide that by two. We then have the accuracy value, if you like, in Australia of 98%, as people will be used to seeing it, which the equivalent in, in the um, BIF accuracy in North America is 0.79. And likewise, the percent old band values differ slightly with a value of seven in Australia and New Zealand and uh, a value of one in North America. The fifth change is um, some changes more within the black box, if you like, within the analytical model. So as we've talked about, there's been a couple of changes in terms of the adoption of a repeatability model, um, which enables multiple scores to be submitted per animal. Also, the, the move to incorporate genomics through the, the incorporation of a, the single step analytical model. Um, but there's also two other changes at an analytical level. So in particular, we move from a series of single trait analyses to now a multi-trait analysis for structural soundness, which is a lot more similar to how we um, calculate other breeding values within the trans-Tasman analysis. So in particular, we're now running a, what they call a bivariate analysis, where the, the two traits uh, are both analysed simultaneously. And that uh, incorporates, I suppose, we're looking at, at claw set, um, not only the scores which are available for claw set, but also the, the scores which are available for foot angle, by considering the genetic correlation, which we um, know or have estimated to exist between those two different traits um, of about plus 0.38. So the, the scores from both different traits now contribute to both breeding values and that increases the, the accuracy of those breeding values. There's also been a, a change in the actual analytical model. Now the, the EBVs, that when, as part of the research from both of those models, um, correlated very highly, but a, a linear model, it was deemed to move from a, the threshold model to a linear model, as it enabled the, um, a lot of those other enhancements that I've talked about to be included that aren't possible if we adopt a, a threshold model. So by that, to ex explain that in a little bit more detail, the, a threshold model, which is what was traditionally used, is, is normally used in genetic evaluation when the phenotypes, if you like, or the, the performance of animals that is collected for the particular trait are kind of just distributed in, in categories um, where we don't get that normal bell curve type of distribution. So when I say categories, normally for traits like is yes or no, uh, where there might be two different categories for that trait. Now in the previous model, the, the scores of, from 1 to 9 were grouped into three categories. So all the scores of 1 to 4 were grouped together, scores of 5 to 6 were grouped together, and scores of 7 to 9 were grouped in the third category. And, and the scores of, I suppose under that threshold model, the scores of 5 to 6 were considered acceptable, and the, the 1 to 4 and the 7 to 9s were considered in an unacceptable kind of category. So under the linear model, um, that's normally applied in genetic evaluation where there's a more normal kind of bell curve distribution and um, that's a far easier model to, to run a genetic evaluation with and as I talked about previously, I've mentioned that it really facilitates a lot of the add-on capability, so the repeatability model, the incorporation of genomics a lot more easily. So the model has now moved to that linear model. One of the limitations is that we do now only incorporate scores of five and above into the analysis. So scores of one to four are not incorporated. But as you can see in, in some of the graphics on the screen, uh, there's only a very small number of uh, or percentage of animals which have a score of one to five. So um, we don't see many scores being uh, lost from the analysis and then in future research we'll, we'll go in and start to consider how we might incorporate those scores of one to four. So across all of those, um, just to summarise those changes, if you like, there was significant changes and improvements made to the analysis in December 2020. So that involved the publication of EVVs for more animals, increased ability for uh, Angus breeders to submit structural scores, incorporation of genomic information in the calculation of the breeding value, the ability to directly compare those breeding values with the, the structural breeding values in, of animals in North America, and also the, the changes to the analytical model. Um, and that have all ultimately resulted in a, a better, if you like, structural soundness um, analysis and, and better breeding values that are available for those traits on Angus animals in Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm.